Violent protests have spread to at least 20 cities across America. Europe continues to struggle to contain the coronavirus. A major police emergency unfolding in London there tonight. There are reports of injuries, bodies on the ground. Deadly U.S. evacuation from Afghanistan. The Israeli airstrikes targeted militants in Gaza. The White House was under lockdown late. It is the deadliest terror attack in France in decades. The U.N. estimates almost a million people have fled their homes. Because the war in Ukraine has begun. guys, welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study on the Rapture and the Endurance of the Saints. In this session, and for the next few sessions, we're going to be sticking to one theme. Uh, all, they're all going to revolve around the themes of the marriage supper of the Lamb, who is the bride, where is the wedding, what can we learn about the timing of the rapture by studying Jewish wedding rituals, uh, we're going to look at the parable of the five foolish and five wise virgins. We're going to critically examine the film before the wrath, which itself examines Jewish wedding rituals. So between this session, um, we should have at least three, four, maybe even five more. They'll all sort of be in this particular vein. In this session, we're going to ask the question, who is the bride and where is the bridegroom? And we're going to expose one of the most glaring significant major problems with the pre-tribulational position in terms of the story that they tell, uh, the story that th in terms of how they understand the events that will unfold in the last days. Now before we jump in, I just want to remind you all uh, again that we, Frontier Alliance International, are hosting a conference this July 13th, 14th, and 15th in Dallas, Texas. Uh, we're putting a lot into this. We'd love to see you there if you're able to make it. Uh, for more information and registration, go to maranathasummit.com. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump in. As I said, we're going to discuss these issues of who is the bride and where is the wedding. Now, I want to ha have to do a little bit of sort of pre preliminary theology uh, where I, this is where I use, you know, technical theological terms, some of you, your eyes glaze over, others go, oh, that, like that's duh, like that was real simple. But let me just say this, intrigually intertwined to the doctrine, the teaching of the pre-tribulational rapture, is the larger system of interpretation called dispensationalism. Dispensationalism, very simply, uh, holds that history is divided up into different time periods, different dispensations. And to be clear, I'm not a dispensationalist. I hold to something called historic premillennialism. It's very simple. I just believe Jesus is going to return before the thousand-year literal reign of Jesus on the earth. And the term historical is to simply say, this is what the earliest Christians believe. This is what the apostles taught. This is what the earliest church writers, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Hippolytus, etc. This is what they believe. So I am a historic premillennialist. Dispensationalism is also premillennial. They believe Jesus returns before the millennium, but they also hold that the rapture happens, that the church is removed from the earth seven years before the return of Jesus. And as I said, they, they, they believe that history is divided up into different dispensations. Each dispensation, each different age, um, has a different economy. God relates to people differently. He expects them to uh, respond to him differently during different periods. So they would say, for example, that you had the dispensation of the law. During that time, God expected Israel to respond to him in a particular way, and thus they could be saved. Well, now they would say we're in the dispensation of grace. We're in the age of grace. It's very different. Now, okay, so hopefully that was simple enough. But then what they also teach, because they look at the prophecy of 70 weeks, that's in Daniel 9, which holds that there are a, there's a period of 490 years. Okay, this is where it gets a little technical, which is 69 
times seven. It's 69 Shavuot. Shavuot is a Hebrew word which means a week. And it can be a week of days, like a seven-day week, or it can be a week of years, seven years. So this is 70 Shavuot, 70 times seven years, 490 years. And then they divide up this 490 years, and I agree with them on this, into a period of 483, so that's the first 69 uh, Shavuot, and then you have one final period of seven years at the end of the age. And during this, all of the, this particular time period, God is only dealing with Israel. Okay, so dispensationalism teaches that God only deals with one particular people at any given time. And so because he only deals with one particular people at any given time, they needed to find a way to get the church out of the picture so that God could go back to dealing with Israel. Okay, so that's their basic storyline. And so then what they teach is that when the church is raptured seven years before the return of Jesus, the church goes up to heaven and celebrates the marriage supper of the Lamb with Jesus in heaven while Israel is suffering the wrath of God on the earth, okay? So this is their storyline, and this is what they're all looking forward to. They're, you know, looking forward to the day when instantly at any moment they'll be caught up to heaven to enjoy the marriage supper of the Lamb while Israel is on the earth suffering. Now, before I jump in and, and sort of correct some of these things, let me just say what the Bible actually does teach. Because let me just say this. The whole dispensationalist, and I tried to just explain it as simply as I can, the whole dispensationalist story, it's chaotic. It's so confusing. To use that picture that I often throw up of the cork board, you know, sort of the, the whiteboard that someone puts all their pictures and all of their diagrams and they have all these pins and all these strings and all these connections and they're trying to explain and they go, this is connected to this because this guy, you know, and you just sit back and go, wow, this person is crazy. I don't understand any of that. This person's obviously schizophrenic. They're just making all these connections. And they're like, no, it all makes sense. And you're like, I don't think it makes sense. That's basically dispensationalism. It's chaos. It's so confusing. I mean, it requires like a lifetime of trying to understand it. You've got the church. You've got Israel. But then you've got these other people, these other saints. They're alive on the earth during the tribulation. But they're not. They're not part of the church. They're called tribulation saints. They're different than us. And then you go, well, what about Matthew 24? It warns us. And you go, nope, Matthew 24, or this part of the Bible, or this part of the New Testament, you know, the whole New Testament, it's uh, parts of it are for Israel, parts of it are for the church, parts of it are for the tribulation saints. And if you don't understand this, then you don't rightly divide the word of God. And I mean, it's chaos. Like, I'm telling you, it is chaos. Now, yes, the Bible requires some study. It requires some understanding. But overarchingly... The story the Bible tells is so much more simple. Like, one of the things that Christians are so often guilty of is majorly overcomplicating the story. We don't need to overcomplicate it. I'm not saying there's not some complicated, difficult, and tricky things in the Bible. That would be an overstatement. But for the most part, the story is actually way more simple than we make it. Now, let me just say... Um, let me just talk about the identity of Israel and the identity of the church. Okay, so after the flood, I'm going to try to keep this very, very simple. After the flood, the Lord looks down on the earth. It's increasingly becoming chaotic. It's violent. It's giving itself to um, all sorts of sexual perversion. You know, you look at Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Like these angels come down and they're like, where are they? Send them out so that we can have sex with them. I mean, you know, you go, wow, that pretty much sounds like uh, Portland today. Or, you know, it sounds like the world today. Like, it's, it was increasingly becoming chaotic. The Lord goes, I need to interject. I need to introduce myself quickly before mankind becomes crazy, before they just roll out into complete insanity through their own rebellion by going their own way. So the Lord looks down, and he just... The way he works is he just picks a guy. He doesn't just randomly pick a guy. He chooses Abram, or who becomes Abraham, and he turns Abram into a father, and he gives him Isaac, and then Isaac has Jacob, and then Jacob has the 12 sons, and they become this becomes Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel. So the Lord picks a guy, chooses a guy, turns him into a father, turns them into a family, turns them into a people, and then ultimately they become a nation. 
the nation or the people of Israel. And then Israel ultimately becomes this holy womb that will bring forth the Messiah, through which the knowledge of God and salvation will come to all peoples. Okay? Basically, pretty simple story. Now, along the way, there had been numerous different Gentiles, non-Israelis, you know, they're not part of the house of Israel, who joined themselves to Israel, and they became part of Israel. So you go, well, so is Israel the literal descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Jacob's name was changed to Israel. So is someone a Jew if they're actually from um, you know, and Jew, by the way, is a term that originally it meant from the tribe of Judah. It has now evolved to mean anyone from Israel. And people get all upset and go, that's not true. That's how it's actually used in the Bible um, at times in the New Testament. Words do develop. They do evolve. And uh, so I don't want to get into that. But anyway, here's the point is, yes, if you are Israel, it's because you are a physical descendant of Jacob. Or it's because you joined yourself through covenant to Israel. You have all kinds of different people, right? Like Ruth and Naomi, like all these different Gentiles throughout the biblical narrative have become part of Israel, not because they were born part of Israel, but through covenant, they joined themselves to Israel. Now, after Jesus, after Yeshua, as we know, many, many Gentiles received the good news and they joined themselves by covenant to the God of Israel. Now, I'm a Gentile. I was raised a Gentile. I'm just some kind of a mixed mutt, you know, Italian, Portuguese, a few other different things. I have, I do have, after doing the DNA test, I have 1% of European Ashkenazi Jew uh, in me. But, you know, like I was raised thoroughly Gentile. I've always understood myself to be Gentile. I'm a Gentile. I will always be a Gentile, biblically speaking. But here's the thing, and here's my point. When all is said and done, the Lord, you know, there will always be different ethnic identities. Like, if you're African, if you're black, even in the resurrection, you will always maintain the beauty of being this distinct ethnicity. I will always be this sort of mixed mud Italian, whatever. If you're Jewish, you'll always be Jewish. If you're Swedish, you will always be Swedish. But all of us, despite our different ethnicities, right, because God loves spice, God loves variety, the age to come is not this homogenized, sanitized age where everybody just looks the same. No, we will all have the beauty of our variety in terms of the way that God created us. But here's the thing. We will all be part of one body, one people. We will become, as the scriptures say, one new man, one new body. It's not like dispensationalists teach that forever Israel has its own unique destiny and then the church has its own very different, unique destiny. And then you have the tribulation saints, and you know you have all these different categories. It's very complicated. It majorly overcomplicates the story. And again, as I said, the story is not, it's, you know, there is some complexity to it, but for the most part, it's a very simple story. And I want to prove that now by working through the biblical narrative, the biblical story, and prove that the real bride, it's actually not the church, that biblically speaking, the original bride of which we are now part of is Israel, that Israel is the bride. And, you know, if you're a Christian, you go, well, the New Testament says that we are the bride. Yes, because the word church in the Greek is ekklesia. It just means the congregation. It doesn't mean the church up the street. It's not talking about a church building. It's not talking about some unique body of people. The, the, the gathering, the congregation, it's the whole household of faith. And we have actually been grafted in. We have joined a previous program that was well underway long before we showed up. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with the Exodus. And... Uh, I teach through this probably in some other um, sessions, for example, in my series on the return of Jesus, which is based on my book, Sinai to Zion. I'm working through this, but for the sake of the rapture here, I want to focus on this today. So the story of the Exodus, this incredibly important story uh, in the Bible, is first and foremost a romance. And a lot of people don't realize this, but it's intended to be understood as a romance. It is actually the story of God, who is the bridegroom, 
wooing, courting, and, and causing Israel to fall in love with him in order that he could make her his bride, in order that he could enter into a betrothal covenant with her that she would legally be his, and that when all is said and done, Israel would be God's people and he would be their God. She would be his wife and God would be her husband. And again, if you're watching this, if you're a Christian, we have been grafted in, we have been brought into this particular program. There's not some separate program, okay? There's not going to be two weddings at the end of the age. There's not two brides. There is one bride. There is one God. There is one wedding. This is so important. Dispensationalism, literally, many of them teach that there will be two different weddings. They say, well, Israel is the bride of Yahweh, and the church is the bride of Jesus, the bride of the Messiah, and I go, wait, what? Like, the scriptures don't talk about this at all. They talk about one people, one wedding, one bride, period. Like, this is, this is unarguable. Okay, so let's begin with the story of Exodus, beginning in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. The Lord has brought Israel out of Egypt. And the whole story, I don't want to, I'm going to kind of buzz through this rather quickly. The whole story is the story of the Lord wooing Israel and saying, leave your old boyfriend, break up with him. I'm so much better. I'm the real deal. Like this other guy is abusive. It's a toxic relationship. These gods of Egypt are, pay, you know, like these are demons. I'm the only one true God. I'm the only one that will truly love you and be faithful to you. So the Lord is wooing Israel to give their full affection to him. So in verse 6, the Lord says to Moses, Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I'm going to set you free from this, again, this toxic, abusive relationship, and I will deliver you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. And again, he uses the language of this strong arm. And this is, I, you know, people don't like it, but the language is clearly there where I go, no, this was a showdown. You know, in sort of typical guy speak, you know, one's flexing. I'm going to show you how strong my arm is. With an outstretched arm and with great judgments, the Lord says, I will take you for my people. I will take you. And the word there in the Hebrew is lakak. Now, I, I may be mispronouncing that a little bit. It's like L-A-Q-A-C-H. So lakak, I don't know. I shouldn't even pretend, but the point, L-A-Q-A-C-H, so Q-C-H, very similar. He says, I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and then you will know that I am the Lord, your God. I, I am the only one. I mean, like, you hear these type of statements throughout the Exodus account. I'm the one that brought you out from under the Egyptians. Now, the phrase there, again, l'chak, it's used multiple other times previously, specifically when someone takes a woman to be his wife. Exodus 6 verse 7, I will take you to be my people. That's actually what we just read. Genesis eleven twenty nine. Abram and Nahor Lachak took wives for themselves. Ishmael's mother Hagar took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Genesis 24, 67, Isaac took Rebekah and she became his wife. Genesis 36 verse 2, Esau Lakak. He took wives from the daughters of Canaan. It's a term that is very frequently used, not just, you know, I'm just going to, you know, take these glasses. It's, it's taking possession of, and it's often used in the context of a man taking a wife. So this is what the Lord says to Israel. Then in chapter 19, you have within this romance narrative, you essentially have the proposal where the, the, the groom-to-be kneels down in this place of vulnerability and offers himself, will you be my wife? Verse 5 and 6, now then, the Lord says, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, this promise that I'm making, this agreement, this covenant, if, then you shall be my segula. That's the Hebrew word segula. It means my crown jewel, my one and only, my prized possession. The Lord says, all the nations of the earth are mine. He says, among all the nations, they all belong to me, but you're going to be special. You're going to be my segula. Like, there's something very unique and special here. Um, the Lord's like saying, like, I could have anyone in the world that I want, but I'm choosing you. I'm choosing Israel. 
And so then the response is Israel says, yes. You know, he sits there and goes, okay, well, what's it going to be? Are you going to be my segul or not? And so in chapter 19, verse 7 and 8, so Moses came, he called the elders of the people, he set before them all of the words where the Lord says, if you'll accept my commandments, you'll be my segula, you'll be my one and only. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. We say yes. So Israel says a yes to the proposal. And then sort of moving forward in the narrative, Israel is now at the foot of Mount Sinai. Because the entire Exodus account is God demonstrating his superiority over the false gods of Egypt, demonstrating the fact that he's really the only one true God of the earth, creator of heaven and earth, creator of everything. He's the only one worthy of worship. It's really what it boils down to. But the story culminates. It moves toward and it culminates at Mount Sinai. And it's at Mount Sinai that God came down. He showed up. He appeared. He came down in blazing fire. And all of these uh, weather events, storm clouds, lightning, thunder, earthquakes, blasting of trumpets, like it's intense. God comes down and settles on the mountain in blazing fire. And he enters into covenant with Israel. It's really a beautiful picture. Like the bridegroom is consumed in blazing fire in the midst of the marriage ceremony. And so before the covenant is about to be made, in chapter 19, verse 10, the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them. Today and tomorrow, let them wash their garments and be ready because in three days I'm coming down on the mountain. Now, within Jewish weddings, even to this day, you still have what's called the, the ritual mikvah. The mikvah is the ritual washing. It's taking a bath. It's like a baptism. So at various Jewish community centers, synagogues all over the world, those who are about to get married will call and make reservations. They'll show up three days before the wedding and do the mikvah, the ritual mikvah. And it um, symbolizes cleansing and purity, purifying themselves in preparation for the wedding. So before the ceremony, before the covenant at Mount Sinai, which was a betrothal covenant, basically a marriage covenant. Before that happened, the Lord has this very conspicuous wedding ritual as part of the story. Consecrate them, have them wash themselves because the wedding is coming in three days. And then in verse 16 and 17, again in chapter 19, you have the chuppah. In any Jewish wedding, you have a chuppah. It's a canopy under which the bride and the groom get married. And it, re it symbolizes the marriage chamber that they will then go to only them, no one else, no babies yet, no pets. You know, just it's their wedding chamber. And the chuppah, the covering, it represents, in a lot of ways it represents God himself covering them, but it represents the 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 uh, exclusivity of this relationship. And so it says, it came about on the third day. Now remember, Israel's been following around the Lord God who has manifest himself in the form of this pillar of cloud by day. And then it it's lights up like fire at night. And the cloud itself settles on the mountain. That's what so God himself settles on the mountain. When it was morning, there was thunder. There was lightning flashes and a thick cloud on the mountain a very loud, loud trumpet sound, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And it literally, in the Hebrew, this translation is the ESV, it says they stood at the foot of the mountain. It literally says they stood under the mountain. Now, they didn't literally stand under the mountain. It's used in ex an expression, but they were under the chuppah, the cloud. God himself provided the wedding chuppah over the mountain. And they stood under it, and they entered into a marriage covenant with God. They agreed to it. He proposed. They agreed to it. And then um, the, 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 the covenant itself, the, um, the ceremony began. And so Torah itself, so Moses reads the entire Torah. Are you guys going to obey this or not? Torah, within this story, the law, is the wedding vows. Okay, so in modern times... You know, when I got married to my wife, Amy, you know, I don't remember what our wedding vows were at all. But, you know, it's kind of all the basic stuff, right? Like, I promise to love and cherish you until death. I mean, that's really what it boils down to. 
I'm making a covenant before God and man unto death. Until one of us is dead, I'm going to remain faithful to you, this very unique, exclusive relationship. And it's not just two people agreeing. It's two people making covenant with God. I'm covenanting with God to be faithful to this person. So these, you know, so modern times, like I said, we just make these things. At this particular ceremony, it was Torah itself that were the wedding vows. I agree to do this. I agree to do that. I agree. I will do all of these things. It's very extensive, obviously. But that is the wedding vows. That's the ketubah. Ketubah is, even to this day, in Jewish weddings, it's the legal agreement. It's more than just, I promise to cherish you and to be the rock in the storms of life and all this sort of like general fluffy niceties and this type of thing. They were like, I agree. I will pick up my socks off the floor. I will clean up after the kids. I will not leave my dishes in the sink. If so, I'm breaking the covenant, you know, like, and I'm guilty. So, you have the ketubah, Exodus 24, verse 3. Moses came and he recounted to the people all the words of the Lord and all of the ordinances. And all the people answered with one voice. Because what do you say in a wedding? I do. I do. They both say I do. All the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. I do. The, the nation together collectively stood before God, under the cloud, at Mount Sinai, Moses read the ketubah, he read the covenant, he read Torah, and they said, we agree, I do. Okay, so that, that's one of the critical stages in the sealing of the covenant in the ceremony. And then, because this is a biblical covenant, every covenant is made with blood. Exodus 24, verse 4, then Moses arose early in the morning, he built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars which represent the 12 tribes of Israel. He sent young men of the sons of Israel. They offered burnt offerings, sacrificed young bulls. So a whole bunch of young bulls were sacrificed as peace offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and he put it in basins and the other half he sprinkles on the altar. So half of the blood goes on the altar. Half of the blood is for the Lord and then the other half of the blood, it says he took the book of the covenant and he reads it again. In the hearing of all the people, they all say, everything the Lord has spoken, we will do. Moses took the blood and he sprinkled it on the people. Now, I personally believe he sprinkled it on the pillars, okay, on the matzibah is the word in Hebrew, these standing rocks which represented the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, the covenant has been sealed with blood, okay? The covenant has been made. For all intents and purposes, the covenant has been sealed, but... What always follows up any modern wedding? At the end of every wedding, you have the marriage supper. That night, after the wedding, everyone gets together, and you have a big dinner. So Exodus 24, again, here's the marriage dinner. Exodus 24, verse 1 and 2. The Lord calls Moses. He says, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 representative elders of Israel. Come up to the mountain. Come up to the Lord. And he says, you shall worship. That you know, He goes, come up the mountain. You all worship me. But Moses goes all the way up. So Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel, they go halfway up. And then Moses goes all the way up. So it says, Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel, they went up and they saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement of Lapis lazuli, blue, bright blue is the sky. And then it says, but God didn't kill them. He didn't raise his hand against them. And then he says, they saw God and they ate and drank. So up there on the mountain, Moses, Aaron, and the representative elders of Israel had a meal. They ate what is the prophetic precursor. Now, please hear me. The prophetic foreshadow to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Remember, this is a betrothal ceremony. Betrothal is a little different than when, how we do it in modern times. But they are considered legally married. They are in covenant. But it's not in a Jewish wedding. It could be as much as a year later, after they have time to prepare, that you actually consummate the marriage, move in together, and then you're actually married. And there would be a big party when they actually got married. But this is the covenant when they are legally joined together, 
but then about a year later they consummate it and there's a big party. So this, within the biblical narrative, this is the betrothal ceremony. The marriage supper of the Lamb is the consummation of what? The covenant at Mount Sinai. The new covenant made in Jesus' blood is the new covenant that's better than this original covenant. But as we, if we understand the biblical narrative, this is the foundation. All the way back here in Torah, the Exodus account, this is the foundation to understand the marriage supper of the Lamb. But guys, who's the bride? It's Israel. Now again, today, if you're a Christian, the only way that you're going to be part of the marriage supper of the Lamb is if you join yourself to this project that has already been underway for a few thousand years. There's not some secondary new plan that came along later. The marriage supper of the Lamb is the consummation of the betrothal covenant that took place at Mount Sinai. The return of Jesus is the greater exodus, the ultimate exodus. When God came down in blazing fire on the mountain, that was a dress rehearsal for when he's coming back in blazing fire and splitting the sky. Okay, so that this is, this is the biblical narrative that we need to understand. Now, you go, are you sure that you're not just reading all these things into the account? No, this is how the prophets, this is how everyone that came after understood these things. Multiple times after this, you have the Lord referring to Israel as his wife, and he refers to himself as her husband or the bridegroom in the prophets, in the Old Testament. As an example, Ezekiel 16, powerful, emotional, moving prophecy, moving chapter, Ezekiel 16. The Lord rescues Israel as a little baby, cast on the side of the road, rejected, despised, wriggling in her blood. And he picks her up, he washes her, he cuts the cord, he cares for her, he raises her. She becomes beautiful, and then he says, and then I married you. Now, that's kind of weird. In modern times, that's weird, I know. But the idea is, he goes like, I became your covering. I took care of you. I gave you everything. But what happened? You weren't grateful. You slept around with every, every other god, god, all of the surrounding nations. That's the story he tells. But when all is said and done, the Lord goes, but despite all of your unfaithfulness, I'm going to remember the covenant that I made with you, and I'm going to make you mine. Okay, so this is a powerful story. But in verse 8, it says this. The Lord says, I passed by you, and I saw that you had reached the age for love. And so what did I do? He said, I spread the edge of my garment over you, and I covered your nakedness. I covered you. I pledged myself to you, and I entered into a covenant with you. He's talking about a marriage covenant. This is the declaration of the Lord. You became mine. You became mine. Again, it's clearly using marriage language here, where the Lord says, basically, I became your husband. Who's he talking to? He's not talking to the church here. He's talking about Israel. Isaiah 54, verses 4 and 5, the Lord says, Don't be afraid, for you won't be put to shame. Don't be humiliated, because you're not going to be disgraced forever. He's talking to Israel. You will forget the shame of your youth. What's the youth? Back when she was an unfaithful slut. I mean, let's just put it, I don't know, what's another word I can use? He says, you won't remember the disgrace of when you were unfaithful. You won't remember that. He says, indeed, your husband is your maker. The Lord goes, I'm your maker. I'm your husband. His name is the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts. He's the Holy One of Israel. He's your redeemer. He's the one that purchased you. He's the one that saved you. And so there's an example again in the prophets where the Lord refers to himself as Israel's husband. And the entire story of Hosea revolves around this theme. The Lord tells Hosea to marry Gomer, a prostitute. And when all is said and done, despite Gomer's unfaithfulness, he remains faithful to her as a model of what the Lord is like. Despite Israel's unfaithfulness, the Lord will remember his covenant that he made with the whole house of Israel. And the Lord says this, when all is said and done, Hosea 2, 19 and 20, despite all of Israel's unfaithfulness, the Lord says, I will take you to be my wife forever. I will take you to be my wife in righteousness, in justice, in love, and compassion. I will take you to be my wife in faithfulness, and you will know the Lord. So there's a handful of other passages that we could look at, 
But again, this is not lost on the prophets, the fact that the Lord entered into a betrothal covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai. This is part of the biblical narrative. Now, with that said, connecting what happened at Sinai to what will happen in the future, where? On Mount Zion. Isaiah hits this real hard. Isaiah chapter 4, the Lord says, when the Lord has, so Isaiah 4 verses 4 through 5, when the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion. Okay, so after she has been cleaned, after she has been washed, and after he has purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst, the guilt that's on her hands, by what? By the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. That's the final seven years. That's the great tribulation. That's the time of Jacob's trouble. By tribulation, by the spirit of judgment and burning, chastisement, the Lord will wash his bride, his people. Then the Lord will create over the whole area of Mount Zion. Again, the betrothal covenant was made at Sinai. The consummation, the marriage supper, happens where? The whole area of Mount Zion and over all of her assemblies, a cloud by day, even smoke, and the brightness of flaming fire at night. He's conjuring up Exodus language, but now it's not at Sinai, it's at Zion. And he says, and over all of the, again, over all of Mount Zion will be this glory. It will be a chuppah. Now, if you read it in English, a lot of them will say like a canopy or a covering. The word there in Hebrew is chuppah. It's clearly using wedding imagery, wedding symbolism. And the picture is essentially that after Israel has been cleansed, that Zion, throughout the entire millennium, it's like an ongoing wedding celebration. It's not just like a one-day deal and it's over. It's like this wedding imagery rests and remains over Mount Zion, this cloud, this hoopah of glory in an ongoing way. So, again, here it's pointing to the eschatological wedding, the consummation of the betrothal covenant. And again, this is before the New Testament was written. This is before there's any discussion of the marriage supper of the Lamb. It was always understood that the betrothal leads to the consummation, leads to the wedding. Isaiah 25, verse 6 and 7. The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet. Now, here's the key. For all peoples. Wait, I thought this was Israel's wedding. Yep, but Isaiah goes, it's going to be way bigger than just Israel. You see, the plan has always been for there to be one new man made up of Jews and Gentiles, of Israel and the nations. One new man, and they're all at the same wedding. Okay? The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet, a feast, a dinner, For who? For Israel? Yeah, for Israel, but for all peoples. Where? On this mountain. And in context, this mountain, again, is Mount Zion. He says it's going to be a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces, choice cuts of meat, and refined aged wine. On this mountain, he will swallow up the covering, which is over all the peoples, the covering of death, the covering of deception, even the veil, which is stretched over the nations. So the picture that the Bible tells is that the covenant that began at Sinai will be consummated in heaven? No. It says the banquet will be on Mount Zion, on the earth. It doesn't say heavenly Zion. It says on this mountain. Isaiah was on the earth prophesying to his people, talking about this mountain. On this mountain, the Lord is going to have a banquet, a choice feast. And he's using, again marriage language. It's not just any old barbecue. Now, in the New Testament, again, just to drive this fact home, there's not, you know, there is a degree to where there is a distinction. I want to be clear. There is some distinction between Israel and the church, but the overlapping nature of their destinies is profound. And you see this very clearly here in Ephesians 2, 8 through 19. A lot of verses. I'm going to read this. The Lord says, by grace you have been saved. You and me, we've been saved by grace through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's not because you are better. It's not because you are superior. It's not because you are more holy. The Lord says, by grace, unmerited favor, the Lord saved you. 
and it's a gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one can boast. There is no one who can boast that says they deserve salvation. He goes, because we're the workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. He chose us, he called us, he created us to do good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Therefore, remember that you, talking to me, talking to you if you're a Gentile, you were formerly Gentiles in the flesh. You lived like Gentiles. You lived like pagans. Believe me, I lived like a pagan, lived like a heathen. And by the Jews, we're called the uncircumcision. The, the so-called circumcision calls us uncircumcised. And yeah, we were. We lived like pagans. He says, but the circumcision, that's performed in the flesh by human hands. And then he says this, okay. Paul is like super many bunny trails. Paul says, remember. You were at that time, back when you were living like a pagan, when you were living like a heathen, you were separate from Christ, excluded from what? The commonwealth of Israel. Remember back when you used to be excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, but now that you're in Christ, you are part of the commonwealth of Israel. Now again, as a Gentile, I am not Israel, I am not a Jew, but I am a fellow heir in Christ, I am a fellow heir with Israel, which means what? I will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Where? On Mount Zion, on the earth. When? When Jesus returns. He says, we who were formerly Gentiles were now part of the commonwealth of Israel. We were strangers to the covenants of promise. We didn't have any hope. We didn't have God. We didn't have anything. But now we're not strangers now we are familiar. Now we're part of. The covenants of Israel belong to us as well. The plan of God has always been that the marriage supper would be a choice feast for all peoples. It's never been just for Israel. There is no feast that is just for Israel and another one that's for the church. No, there is one feast. There is one banquet. There is one wedding. There is one people. There is one commonwealth. In Christ, there is one body, there is one people, there is one ecclesia. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off, you were formerly not part of the club, no, you've been brought near. By what? The blood of Christ. What is it that brings us near? The blood of Christ, his death, his atoning work on the cross. For he himself is our peace, here it is, who made both groups... Israel and the nations, the Gentiles, in Christ, he made both groups into one. One people. And he broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity. He abolished this conflict, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make, here it is again, he repeats himself, he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and he might reconcile them both in one body. Is there Israel in the church? Are there two bodies? No, there is one body. Those who are redeemed in Christ are part of one body, and we belong to God through the cross, ha having put it to death um, by the enmity. He says, so then, skipping forward, you are no longer strangers. You're no longer aliens. You're no longer foreigners but you are fellow citizens. Fellow citizens of what? The commonwealth of Israel. Fellow citizens with the saints, and you are of God's household. There is only one family, one people, one new man, one commonwealth, one people. We are all one in Christ. doesn't matter, Jew or Gentile, it doesn't matter. Like, the New Testament teaches this over and over and over again from the beginning to the end. There is only one new man. So, when Jesus comes along in Matthew 8, he sees the um, centurion, who was a God-fearer, he was a Gentile, and, you know, he needed Jesus to do a miracle, and he goes, hey, Jesus, look, I know how this works. I don't want to take up your time. You just say the word, my servant will be healed. Like, I don't want you to walk all the way over there. It'll take forever. Like, I have people under me. They follow my commandments. I know how it works with you. You're the Messiah. Just say the word. My servant will be healed. And Jesus, Matthew 8, verse 10, goes, I haven't even seen, I'm telling you what, 
truly, truly, I say to you, I haven't seen anyone with so much with such great faith, even in all of Israel. Like here's this Gentile, and he has better faith in the Jewish Messiah than all of Israel. He says, I say to you, and then he makes this statement. He says says to the Jews around him, who think that the marriage supper, who think that the consummation is just for them, because it was Israel that made the covenant with God at Sinai. And he goes, I'm telling you guys, many, many will come from all over the world, from the east and the west, and they will recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, Jacob is Israel in the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven is just a euphemism. It doesn't mean up in heaven. It means the kingdom that is governed by God. It's governed by heaven. He goes, there's going to be Gentiles from all over the world, and they're going to gather together and sit at the same table with the patriarchs. What's, what's this banquet? What's this table? What's this feast that he's talking about? He's talking about Isaiah 25. He's talking about Isaiah 4. When at that time, after the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, after he's purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem by the spirit of judgment and burning, the hoopah will be there, and the Lord will have a choice feast, a banquet, and they will all together recline at the table. Gentiles, the centurion, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Pre-tribulationists teach that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they don't get raptured. They're not part of the rapture. They're part of Israel. They're part of some different program. We get raptured up to heaven. You go, how in the world can you say that the faithful Jews of old, the faithful uh, Hebrews of old, they're not even part of their own marriage consummation? It just belongs now to the church? This is theft. This is, it's identity theft. It's marriage theft. It's covenant theft. It's, it's, it's really perverse when you understand the story as it's taught by pre-tribulationists. Luke 22, verse 14 through 18. When the hour had come, Jesus reclined at the table. It's all whenever they're eating, it's reclining at the table. And the apostles were with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover. This is the Passover that he's eating just before he's arrested, betrayed, and crucified. I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I say to you, I'm not going to eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. He goes, I'm not going to eat the Passover dinner again. This is the most continually celebrated festival, Jewish religious festival in human history. And since Jesus left for the past 2,000 years, every year the Jews and many Christians today celebrate Pesach, they celebrate Passover. Jesus says, I'm not going to eat it again until I eat it in the kingdom of God with you. When he had taken the cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. And I say to you, I won't drink from the fruit of the vine. I won't drink wine, or grape juice, however you want. I won't drink wine again until the kingdom of God comes. I will not drink from the fruit of the vine until I drink it afresh in the kingdom of God of God. Now, other scriptures, Matthew 19, Matthew 25, say, when the Son of Man comes in the glory of his Father, then he will sit on his throne of glory. That's the throne of his father, David. It says, when the Son of Man comes from heaven, Jesus has not come back yet. We all agree with that. After that, he will restore the throne of David. After that is when he will establish the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God in as general broad sense, you can say it's now, like God rules from heaven. But the kingdom of God is not established until the king restores the throne, until Jesus comes back, until the kingdom is actually restored. It's not just like a mystical, invisible, spiritual kingdom. Like when the scriptures talk about the kingdom of God, it's a very literal kingdom. That's why in Acts chapter 1, after Jesus talked about the kingdom of God for 40 days, the first question his disciples asked is, is it at this time that you're going to restore the kingdom of God? Like, it wasn't yet. And he goes, it's not for you to know the times. You go make disciples of all nations. You go make disciples. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He's going to empower you. The kingdom of God is not established until the throne of the king is reestablished. And that happens after he returns. After he returns, he says, I will drink once again. I'll eat this Passover meal. I'll drink from the fruit of the vine with you. Where? In my father's kingdom or in my kingdom. Where? Isaiah has already told us 
on Mount Zion. What began on Mount Sinai is consummated in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. And so then in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul the Apostle says this, I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Break this bread. Remember, look back, look back to the Exodus and look forward to the consummation. Okay, what is the Passover? They were eating the Passover meal. What's the Passover? Remember. Remember, remember, remember what I did. Remember what I did during the Exodus. Remember when God came down on the mountain. Remember the covenant. Remember what you agreed to. Remember. But here, Paul is saying, do this in remembrance of what happened on the cross, which guaranteed what? The future marriage supper. So you're looking back, we're looking forward. There's an element we're looking back and we're remembering the shed blood of Jesus, but we're also looking back to the covenant at Mount Sinai. But ultimately, all of those things give us the ability to look forward to the day when we will drink from that cup afresh with him. And then it's so beautiful. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. On that day, the master, here's the blood-soaked divine warrior. He says, on that day, I will gird myself to serve you. You go, what? Even after you come back, the lion of the tribe of Judah, sword of mouth, the, I mean, the sword comes out of your mouth, you slay the nations, you heap up the dead, and then you're serving us at the marriage. That's what he says, the master on that day, he will gird himself to serve. Serve us. Insane. I mean, craziness. This is the cup of my new covenant. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance, in memorial. Remember, remember the Exodus, remember Sinai, remember the cross, and look forward to Zion. Because that's, that's when the real feast will happen. Now, the pre-tribulational camp claims that Israel, Israel is the bride. Whoever is left of Israel when Jesus returns will all be saved. Paul the Apostle tells us in Romans 11, all Israel will be saved. Zechariah 12 tells us that the inhabitants of Jerusalem, all the tribes of the land, will look upon the one they have pierced, and the Lord will pour out his spirit of grace and supplication. And they will all come to know him from that day forward. It says in Ezekiel 39, okay, Israel is the bride. We have been grafted into this previous project. We are the bride. Israel is the bride. The pre-tribulational camp teaches that we go up to heaven while Israel is on the earth suffering, and then we celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. Guys, there is no scripture anywhere in the Bible that says the marriage supper is in heaven. Every scripture says it will take place on the earth after Jesus returns on Mount Zion, and it teaches that it's Israel's wedding. Israel is the bride. We have been grafted in as one new man, one body, one people, one commonwealth. There's one wedding. There's one wedding. Many highly respected pre-tribulational teachers that I know, they actually say there will be two weddings. They say Israel will be married to Yahweh and the church will be married to Jesus. And I go, guys, there's only one God. Like, what are you talking about? When Jesus calls himself the bridegroom, he tells all these parables throughout the Gospels and he calls himself the bridegroom. Do you think a Jew didn't recognize what he was saying? They're going, wait a minute, you're framing yourself as the bridegroom? You're saying that you are the fiery bridegroom God of Sinai. Jesus was in no unclear terms speaking the language of the first century Jews that were hearing him. And he was identifying as Yahweh God Almighty, the one who came down in fire, that Moses and Aaron, the elders, looked up and they saw his feet. Okay, Jesus was claiming to be the bridegroom. And then he says, I'm leaving and you're going to grieve. You're going to fast because you're going to be yearning for the bridegroom. There's only one bridegroom there's only one bride. There's only one wedding. And we're all looking forward to it together. It doesn't happen up in heaven while Israel suffers on the earth. That's actually a really disgusting teaching. It's a disgusting teaching. You know, I mean, like, just put that in human terms. Like, sorry, you know, I'm going to enjoy your wedding while you're getting beat up and this type of thing. And then you'll often hear the pre tribbers say, why would God ever let his bride get beat up? but they teach that Israel is going to get beat up. 
you know, and we're going to take a whole session to discuss that particular little cliche that's often thrown around. God would never beat up his bride. That's so common. It's such a emotionally manipulative, blasphemous, literally, it's a blasphemous statement to make. But for now, we're going to leave this here. I trust that this was helpful. This will be an important foundational session to understand some of the um, other sessions that we're going to cover as we, as I said, continue in this vein, this theme of discussing the marriage supper of the Lamb, Jewish wedding rituals, and, uh, and this type of thing. So I trust that this was helpful. So amen and amen. Look forward to seeing you all next week. Until then, guys, have a great week. Be blessed. And Maranatha. Hey, folks. Stephanie Quick here. Thank you for watching the Maranatha Global Bible Study. I'm just going to take a moment of your time to share with you the core conviction and driving ambition of Frontier Alliance International and FAI Studios, why we do what we do. And you'll find it in Romans 15, 20, where Paul made it clear, crystal clear, that his preoccupying life ambition was to lay foundations for the gospel where none existed, to go where nobody had ever heard the name of Jesus and preach the name of Jesus, preach the gospel of the kingdom and demonstrate the person of Jesus and the gospel of the kingdom through his life indeed. And that is our preoccupying life ambition. We share that with Paul. So if you want to find out more about our pioneering initiatives in the 1040 window, head to faistudios.org. Thanks for your time. Maranatha.